I want to introduce our presenters to you today. Um, Wendy Acoth is not quite here yet. She will be uh, joining us in just a little bit. Um, Carla Bolter is here. She's a great one to ask questions about uh, native plants and perennials and all those kinds of things. She knows wealth of information about those topics. Um, Larry and Leslie Cook are here. Um, they are excellent avid vegetable gardeners. They have a huge home garden and have been gardening for a long time. Uh, they used to be master gardeners in Virginia and then relocated and joined us here as Delaware master gardeners. Um, they are also a wealth of knowledge on all kinds of topics, but I think that their specialties are uh, vegetables and strawberries. Um, they recently did a presentation on strawberry gardening. Um, and we have Linda Sperry joining us as one of our experts for the first time. So we wanna welcome her and tell her not to be afraid. We're all having fun here. And um, she's also an avid vegetable gardener and um, she knows a lot about uh, all kinds of aspects about home gardening and gardening in greenhouses and gardening in shade because she has a shady area. Um, so those are kind of everybody's areas of expertise. Um, so I am going to turn it over to them to start with the questions that um, were submitted in advance and then we'll open it up to any extra additional questions you guys have later. Um, so <laughs> We'll go ahead and make sure everybody's unmuted here, Linda. Um, and uh, and we're going to get on to our first question that was submitted. And uh, I know uh, Larry, you had something to say about this, and Carla also. Um, guys want to take it away and uh, talk about this topic? Okay. Um, you were asking <clears throat> whether mountain ash would be a good choice for your yard, uh, but you had uh, expressed some concerns about uh, some of the drawbacks. And uh, I agree, you know, you notice it's called a mountain ash. It does live in uh, higher elevations a lot better than it does down here. Um, what I was suggesting was perhaps an amelanchier, which is also known as a service berry or a shad blow. Um, it's a small tree. It will bear fruit. Uh, birds love it. And I think that that might be a better choice in this area for you. Yeah, Les, Leslie and I uh, both came up with the same thing independently from what Carla says, so we just like to, to second that. Um, it is a native plant. Um, it's pretty hardy, pretty easy to uh, maintain, so uh, uh, I think it's be a good choice. It's not the only choice you could make, but uh, that's the one we'll recommend. Right. You still get them this time of the year if you're quick. The, ner the nursery should still have some. And there was also a recommendation for winterberry holly, but since it is a holly, you do have to have more than one plant or you won't get any berries. You have male and female plants, so that's another option there too. And Carla, correct me if I'm wrong, but service berries are not toxic, but winter berries are. I do believe you can eat service berries if you're yeah. so inclined. I would definitely not eat a winter berry. Yeah, they're not good also, for pets either. Right, and I know that a lot of, you know, there are some shorter varieties. For instance, I have a uh, red sprite and the male pollinator, I think is Jolly Jim. Um, he's a little taller than the, the girls are at this point, red sprite being the girls. Um, but at this point, my Jolly Jim is maybe six feet tall. Um, there are other varieties that do get taller, but it's still more of a shrub than a tree. Mm -hmm. Just in case you were, you know, more wanting a tree form. Okay. Um, I don't believe the person who asked this question is actually here yet. So um, maybe if That's she comes funny. later, um, she can uh, follow, we can follow up with her, we'll see. Um, so we're gonna go on to the next question. 
Um, you guys can continue. I'm writing down the questions that you put into the chat box so you can continue doing that. And when we get through these, we will address your questions. This is the next question. Um, I believe, I believe Janine submitted this and I believe she's here. Um, problem with her raised bed. Yeah, Linda has some inputs on that. Yeah, um, I was, uh, when I was reading this information um, from, from what I can glean that you, that's a pretty, pretty deep raised bed. And really to add weed cloth uh, to the bottom of it, in addition to the screening, I think what you're going to run into is it's going to retain too much moisture. You're going to end up with root rot. Yeah. Um, it's just not going to have the drainage that it needs, uh, which could be one of the problems that you're having. Um, then I think the second part of it was about gelatin. And, yeah, we, um, have, we have that on a different slide, I believe. That's coming oh, up. You do? Okay. Yeah. I separated her questions into, into uh, different elements yeah. here. So, so basically I would say get, get rid of the weed cloth. I think that you're going to improve your garden tremendously if you do that. And then here's the, uh, the gelatin question for you, Linda. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you're, when you're growing vegetables, vegetables have, besides just nitrogen, they have the need for a lot of other elements uh, uh, like calcium, mm -hmm. like that, for example. And if you're just giving them one thing, uh, it's, it's not going to be sufficient, in particular for uh, vegetables like tomatoes. Um, you probably, you, you did a, a soil test, is that correct? Yes, mm -hmm. soil test, okay. Um, I, I think you'd be better off with a, with a regular uh, 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 fertilizer or better still compost, using a compost. I think you're going to get a better uh, fertilization. Gelatin, uh, if you're going to use it, um, definitely you need to dilute it. Do not put it dry on, on, onto the soil. Okay. Um, question four was also from the same person about um, adding worms to their, to the raised bed. Red wigglers are usually the best, um, and I think you can get them at bait shops. I, I've never been to a bait shop, so I, I'm not sure what they what they offer. Um, but probably you're going to be better off, as I was re referring to earlier, by using compost, um, mm -hmm. and you can make your own compost pile with um, the scraps from your kitchen, the vegetable scraps, fruit scraps, um, leaves, uh, grass that hasn't had any kind of chemicals put on it. Um, and it, it doesn't take a very big space in your, in your yard. And when you use that, you can make a, a tea out of the compost or you can side dress your, your vegetable plants with the compost. And it's, it's just a much healthier uh, option for fertilizing. And, and Linda, just as a, a, a personal uh, anecdotal, um, we do a lot of composting. A lot of it comes from the kitchen, but a lot of it comes from biomass from the garden. Um, when I cleaned it out last time, we had hundreds and hundreds of worms yeah. in that compost that we just transferred to the garden. They come up out of the soil on their own. So you get, into the you get them for free. Yep. Okay. And I, I also have red wrigglers um, in my compost. And whenever we add compost to the, to the beds, some of them come along. So we figure right. they'll just con continue doing their composting job, um, breaking down, further breaking down things that are in the, in the garden beds. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, then we had a question about ants in the garden. Um, so Linda, I'll let you talk about ants. Uh, ant farming the aphids, because um, that's I found that fascinating when I was looking about that. So go ahead. Well, ants can be both beneficial and a, a problem. Uh, one of the, the negatives from having a lot of ants in your garden is that they tend to um, farm aphids. And by that, I mean they will 
bring aphids or, or gather aphids and put them on your plant, the aphids are going to uh, suck into your fruits and vegetables, um, which creates a, a, a disease on them. It also uh, uh, deforms the fruits or vegetables. Um, and they're, they're kind of difficult to get rid of once the aphids are on your um, plants. Now, one of the things you can do, and it's probably the, the healthiest for the environment, is just take your garden hose and just shoot them off with a strong stream of water. Um, if you do have ants, besides the aphids on your plants, make sure you get the ants off as well. Um, they're going to they're gonna come back. Um, they're, if they found a plant they like, they will come back. The only other thing you can do is find out where the ants are coming from. And you can put uh, pour boiling water on the nest or, or something like that. Try not to use any kind of chemicals or pesticides because when you're doing that, you're not only harming the ants, you're going to harm all the beneficial insects as well. Okay. I believe that was part of our four part question there from uh, Janine. So I hope that answered your questions. Um, let us know if later if you have um, further questions on this topic. Um, so we'll go on to the next question. Um, if you look in this picture, you can see these uh, lovely looking berries there um, that we're seeing all over the place. Um, Carla, you wanna talk about these? Sure, this is a pokeberry plant, um, pokeweed. It's got an enormous taproot, and from the size of the plant that I see in this picture, you'll feel like you're digging to China to get the thing out, but if you leave part of the taproot, the plant will come back. Mm -hmm. I suggest you chop it down now uh, before the berries really get eaten. Uh, because once they, the birds start eating the berries, you'll have poke berries all over the place. Mm -hmm. And trust me, you don't want that. <laughs> uh, it is a weed and I would not eat it, definitely not. Um, it's an interesting looking plant, but uh, considering mm -hmm. the fact that it'll seed itself around and uh, you have these big deep tap roots when the plant really gets going. Um, what I suggest is if you do see any more, uh, when they're small, you can pull them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, yeah, get rid of the thing. I would recommend using gloves if you're gonna deal with it also because it does have, it's toxic, this plant is toxic from top to bottom, roots, leaves, stems, everything. Yeah. Um, and it can irritate your skin if you touch it, so. Yeah, don't put it in compost. No, no. trash. <laughs> you know, make sure it's, you- It's definitely it, trash. You trash it. And, um, Carl, is it, you're totally right. I've seen these, we've, we've harvested these to get rid of them out at Bombay Hook before I've seen these things over 12 feet tall. Yep, they get enormous and their tap roots are just as big down yeah. below. They are native though, aren't they? Yes. yes. I believe they are. <laughs> yeah, one of those one of those natives that's also a weed. <laughs> not, not so good. Native Americans used to use the, ber the berries uh, for one of the things they used to use it for, uh, it's a, makes a good dye. Right. Yeah. And I think I read that if they are like thoroughly cooked, it cooks yep. out the poison, but I don't think I would even want to try that. I wouldn't try it. <laughs> <laughs> that, medicinal value. That desperate. Yeah. All right, we're going to go on to the next question. Um, this was submitted. Yeah. Um, and let me see if I can get this video to play. This is fun. This is so cute. <laughs> Okay, I hope you guys could see that. Could everybody see the video? Yeah. Did you see it playing? Sometimes it doesn't play that well over Zoom, so I hope you got to see it. It's a little slower. Yeah, it didn't show up as well as it was in the email. Yeah, Zoom, seeing these over Zoom is not that great. I'll play it again for you so you can watch it again because it's pretty short. You can see the little birds in there hopping around, making holes in the garden and flipping some soil around. And you wonder what they're doing. Um, 
Carla, you want to you want to tell about it or Larry? Yeah, um, they're taking a dust bath. They do that to uh, get rid of the parasites on them, their uh, feathers. But basically, they get into a spot where they've got some dust and they just you know fluff it all over themselves. Uh, and that's what they appear to be doing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that they've actually made little depressions in the uh, the mulch in there probably to get down to the soil, I would think. Mm. But uh, that's normal. It's like, you know, they take bird baths. They also take dust baths. And we decided these were sparrows, right? Or Larry, did you say you thought they were finches too? It was, it was hard for me to tell for sure. I, I know yeah. were at least one of them were sparrows, but thought I saw a finch in there. But we know that we from our place, we see both of those uh, varieties of birds, uh, songbirds. Uh, use the dust bath and water bath and the water bath yeah right mm -hmm. yeah i just i thought this was really cool that was a great <laughs> question okay go oh, on. i'm done the next question is oh, another one sorry debbie on the last oh, one sorry. yes I think the lady asked about preen Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. Go ahead, Larry. Sorry about that. Forgot well, that. I think the question, the two part, the second part of the question was uh, the gardener had used some, uh, put some preen down there for, I'm assuming, to deal with uh, potential weeds or something she didn't want to grow. Birds aren't going to eat it. They're, they're, they know better than that. It'll just fly around with the rest of the, the dust that's flying around in there, so it shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Okay, and then here's another problem weed. Uh, Linda, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, this is, uh, I call it hairy crab weed. Um, Carla calls it uh, mulberry, mulberry weed. Yeah, and I don't know where I got it from. Um, apparently, I got it uh, when I got something from a nursery a couple of years back, like four years back, and it's everywhere. Uh, it, it, likes to hide um, underneath your plants yeah. that you really like to have and it it hides really deep where you can't see it if you don't start pulling this up as soon as you see it when it gets to the point i don't know if you can see on on this uh, picture here where it has little flowers on it it's it's going to seed and it will throw bazillions of seeds out when it when it goes to seed and they'll lay dormant for up to four or five years. <laughs> so, you know, just because you think you got it doesn't mean they won't come up again. And I have it, I go out every day, I'm pulling three and four handfuls of this stuff up and I go out the next day and there's just as many more out there and they're just as tall as the other ones were. It's, it's really a problem. And about the only thing you can do besides pulling it, and you have to be vigorous about doing that, is to uh, to get a pre-emergent in March and put a pre-emergent down mm -hmm. before all of your other plants start to come up. But you're still going to end up having to pull it. It's it's a real problem. Right. And it, it is also uh, very right, very hard to eradicate once you get them. But yep. uh, part of the secret to success is definitely pulling it before it starts setting seed. It, it puts uh, down a, a, a skinny but long taproot and it's very hard to get out after the first year. Mm -hmm. But if you like mulberry trees, just leave it there. And the, also like the uh, pokeberry, you, you're going to want to throw that in the trash rather than the compost. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> hey, uh... Here is another question that was submitted um, about the abravite dying. Um, Larry, I know you had something to say about this. Yeah, we, we had a couple of questions on that. Let me just look at my okay. uh, um, Yeah, the, the one of them was, we know they're about 20 years ago, 20 years old, that's what we, we saw in the, uh, the email, but the, uh, we had a question on how far apart are the trunks on these? I can't tell from looking at the left or right side of the of the ones that are still viable. Okay, it looks pretty close. Do we know? Is, is the 
Is the okay, uh, Liz, I, I believe Liz um, Calio, Calio asked this question. Um, Liz, are you here? If you are, you can uh, unmute yourself and you can uh, talk to Larry about this. No? Yeah, I'm not sure if she's here. There is. I, I don't think she is, Carla. Okay. I just looked well, at the. Maybe we can contact her afterwards. But um, okay. I guess just for everybody else, else edification, if you want me to continue on this, Deb? Sure. Um, Arborvitaes, um, people use them a lot for uh, privacy, a visual break, and, and also and or for a wind break. And they do uh, serve a pretty good, do that pretty well. But you have to be careful about when you, when you put them in. They are a fast growing plant. They're genetically engineered to do that. Uh, but if you grow them too close, they get to, to what looks like this is. It's, it's, a, it's a hedge, it almost looks like. You can't tell how many actual trees are in there. Um, it really cuts down on the wind going between plants. And that's, that's a potential uh, area where they're tight like that for the moisture to build up and for a fungus to develop. I'm not saying this is, but I'm not saying it isn't. That's why we have to ask some, some more questions. It looks like the one on the on the left side that's really nothing but a, a leftover trunk. It looks like it was trimmed all the way up, but it, it appears to be apparently dead or close to it. And then the one on the right, which isn't looking a lot better, um, it, it looks like it's been going for a while. I mean, it, there's a, clearly a walkthrough area there that, that the uh, foliage has been gone for a while. It can be sprayed with a fungicide, but my concern with spraying with a fungicide, if it is determined that, that this is a fungal-based um, problem, it's really tough to get in between those, those uh, uh, arborvitaes. Now, you can hedge cut them with a, with a pole cutter. That's a lot of work. Um, so the, the long-term um, remedy to this is when, you, when you're planting um, arborvitaes or cypress or junipers, to, to achieve a, a, this kind of a effect, a, a, a tall hedge, if you will, you want to be very careful about uh, not planting them too close together. Now, I'm not going to say exactly what it should be, four feet, five feet, six feet, because it's going to depend on, this, on the variety that you, that you get. Some of these will grow 50 feet tall. Others top out at 12, 15 feet. And so they're, they're, it's a function, the, the height, and with uh, our, have a ratio on most growing plants, especially things like trees. So um, if we can get in touch with her and answer a few more questions that we have for her, we might be able to, to, um, to come to a solution for her that would be workable for her. Right, and I would like to add, um, I know that a lot of people plant Leyland cypresses or Ibrovite for a hedge, but... Uh, and they plant them way too close together because when you're dealing with a small tree, you look like you have this enormous space, but you really <clears> have to research how big this tree is going to get eventually, because what happens is they do, they, you know, when they get large, they're just smashed together and there's no room for light or uh, air to get through them and they do, they're very, susceptible to diseases at that point. Mm -hmm. And, and what will happen, we've seen it happen in a couple of places uh, over the years, in a hedge like this, once it gets infected, it can run down the whole, the oh, whole yeah. line of trees right. and, and kill all of them. Yep. Right. It's, it's a much better idea to, to break up your plantings and, and <clears throat> put different types of, of plants in there, different types of shrubs, rather than running with all one type. Right. Yeah. yeah. As they say, variety is the spice of life. Okay. Okay, the, the next question um, oh, Oprah. was a, an Oprah question. At, um, trying to remember who submitted this. Hold on, I have it written down here somewhere. This Rasheen. Rasheen. Uh, yeah, Rashmi um, asked about um, the okra not fruiting um, and she said she had given shared seeds with people and the other people's uh, plants are growing fine um, but she's not getting fruit so we are gonna we might have some questions for you more questions to uh, ask 
to find out uh, what exactly the situation is with your plant. So um, Rashmi, I know you're here. If you want to unmute yourself, uh, maybe uh, Larry and uh, Linda have some questions for you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> you want to go first, Larry? Yeah, first, first question. Um, did, did you actually have blossoms this year? Yeah. You say they kind of qualified. Some or a lot or how did they compare to last year? Because you said last year you had a good good harvest. Yeah, last year I have like plenty. Uh, like I am getting good harvest from the okra. Uh, like last from last five years I'm getting good uh, okra harvesting, but this year they <laughs> disappointed me. Yeah, but but how about the? Did you get a the same amount of blossoms this year that you've gotten past years or not? Yeah, I, I'm getting the blossoms, but they are not like they are just uh, routing like they are just uh, getting off uh, drying on the plant. And okay. All right. Second question. Did you plant this year's crop in the same location as last year's crop? Yes. And how many years have you grown okra in that same spot? Uh, almost. This is my sixth year. No. Oh. Okay. Um, what do you do to your soil in the off season where those okras are? Do you amend it? Do you put any soil in it or not? I'm putting like compost. Uh, I'm making compost, so I'm putting that compost. Okay. But this time, I think there is one thing I I added new soil very late after I planted the okra. So that's the thing I did differently. Okay. Um, have you ever done a soil test? No. Um, the uh, University of Delaware has a soil uh, test lab. Um, you can pick up uh, from a master gardener uh, location in any one of the three counties uh, the, the kit. Uh, they do charge $15 to get the, the kit done. Most states do that. Um, and they give you a very detailed analysis of your, your mineral content. Planting almost any um, plant vegetables included uh, in the same place every year eventually will deplete the nutrients that that plant particularly needs. That's why, uh, in, for example, in Delaware, you see one year soy in, in a location, soybean. Next year, you see corn. And in between, oh. they put some amendments in like gypsum or, or something else that they need, uh, chicken, manure, those different kinds of things. But they're amending the soil. I, oh. I, you got the blossoms. Um, the soil is a contributing factor, but I think you have to think back now, the last month, six weeks, uh, okra is susceptible to high heat and to cold. Uh, now the cold, the cold I don't think was a problem this year, but the high heat quite possibly did. Um, how do you water your, your plants? Uh, I water with the hose. Okay, and where, where do you point the hose? Uh, near the roots. Good. Yeah. That's exactly how you should do it. If you get it up on the leaves and even on the, the, the fl blossoms and fruit that are setting, uh, you can induce some, some fungal growth uh, or possible bacteria. Okra, yeah. Just for the sake of other people, I'm sure you know this, but blossoms only last about one day. Yeah. It's kind of like a rose of Sharon uh, hibiscus. Yeah. You can flower one day and it falls off the next day. It's mm -hmm. just the nature of the plant. So um, they don't get pollinated I'm assuming way. you had good pollination. Did you see pollinators coming around to your blossoms? Yes. Okay. So that you don't think that was a problem, lack of pollination? Yeah, but I, I saw the plant, uh, the plant look healthy. The leaves are like bigger. So this huh? leaf look very big uh, rather than last year a leaf. So yeah. is that the problem? The leaf, leaf are getting healthier, uh, but they are not uh, uh, giving fruit. Well, when you're, getting, when you're getting a lot of growth, a lot of green growth, that, that's a sign of uh, caro phosphorus, right? Uh, the, too much nitrogen. Too much yeah, nitrogen. nitrogen. Too much nitrogen. nitrogen, yeah. You need more phosphorus. <clears throat> yeah. So you may, I, I think you've depleted your soil or you, you've caused, you, they used up some of the, the essential minerals that that plant needs. You need to plant it in another location or this winter at least uh, amend, get a soil test and amend your soil 
consistent with what they recommend from the soil lab. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can, I, can I interject real quick? Um, the price of the soil test has increased with University of Delaware. Um, it's now $17 for a soil test. Mm -hmm. And in the chat box, I actually put the link to the University of Delaware soil testing lab. Um, so if you click that link, it will take you to the University of Delaware soil testing lab. Okay. And they'll tell you how to take a soil sample and okay. what to do now with COVID um, because now we can, you can't go to any the extension offices so uh, you can still mail it uh, they're sending things to a PO box but if you follow that link it will take you to where you need to go okay thank you I have one question too um, when did you fertilize your your okra I put like after one month okay after what you one month. What like, she should I, do is hold off on fertilizing until the plant is starting to make fruit. Okay. Okay. Because what's happening is you were feeding the leaves and it's all the energy is going to the leaves and none of it's going to the fruit. Okay, got it. Got it. So do I need to change all the soil? Like my husband, he's suggesting me like we are using the same soil from last five years. We are adding new soil, composting in that, but uh, do we need to change a uh, whole garden bed soil for that? If you have if you have enough space to go to another location, I don't know how many okra plants you have. I know they get big. We used to grow it. Um, but if you have enough space to go to another location, then and, and then move move whatever was in that location. Say those are tomatoes over there or something. Okay. The tomatoes to the okra. It's called crop rotation. You should, in, generally speaking, in, in vegetable gardening, you shouldn't put um, the same plant in the same space mm -hmm. until three years later. So it's a three-year rotation. But that doesn't mean you get away with not having to do a soil test or to amend the soil. You, I really strongly recommend get a soil test for where you're growing everything. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Rashmi, don't go away because I believe the next question is yeah. also yours about the uh, the curry leaf plants. And uh, just as a little disclaimer here, um, we do our best to answer this question, but these are, are not plants that are typically grown in Delaware. Um, but we did look some things up for you. So um, I know Larry had something to, to talk about about these plants. Yeah, Leslie's, Leslie's got some questions here, so we'll start. Okay. There's a couple of things that, that come to mind about why the chips would, would, might be yellow. How old are these plants? And there's like a three-year-old. Okay. okay. Are, it looks from the photograph like they're in pots. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we cannot keep them outside during winter, right. so I have okay. to bring the pot inside the house. And, and how is the drainage on those pots? Uh, I, I, th there is a, like a good drainage in the pot. So, so it has holes in the bottom of the pot? Yeah. Yeah. It has a hole. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this year, I just changed the soil. I, I, um, uh, every year, I change the soil from the container. I put, add new soil mm -hmm. uh, for the plant. And this year, I use Miracle Gold. Uh, after that, this happened to my plant. Mm, what? I'm curious, why, why do you change the soil every year? I think the plant grow very well. Like All the soil is old, so even if I add fertilizer, that that will not sufficient for the this particular plant. Well, one of the, one of the problems with trying to grow this plant is that it's not typically it's not certainly not native, um, and typically grows in a zones that have much higher heat. Mm -hmm. Maybe it may be um, reacting to not having sufficient heat as well as maybe having too much water, which typically is is a, a yellow leaf result. Okay. Okay. How how uh, you, how how old is this plant? Three years. A three year, three year. And um, this is the first year you've seen the yellowing of the leaves. Yeah. How how often do you water it? Uh, weekly. This plant does not need more water. Uh huh. So when I I will check if the soil is dry, uh, one inch, uh -huh. I, and then I will water this plant. And it gets it gets full uh, sunlight. Yeah, it's outside right now. Okay. Um, well, uh, mm -hmm. you got a pot. You said it's not drainage. 
I would check if you have the ability to, you may already have one of these, it's a device. It's, um, it's got two prongs on it. Most of the ones I've seen, it's a, it's a uh, moisture meter for soil okay. and you just stick it in the soil um, and it's got a little gauge reading on it. Um, you can buy them at any nursery or big box store uh, in the garden section. Um, they're nominally anywhere between eight and $10, I think, something like that. You can use it outside in the garden. Okay. So what happens sometimes is uh, soil looks dry on the top, so you water it, but mm -hmm. it's up at the bottom, and you don't know that. It may still be draining, but they may, it may also be drowning the roots, which could be causing the yellow, yellowing mm -hmm. tips. Um, so the, the meter, you can plunge down in there deep enough to find out where the roots are is where you need to really know how moist the soil is or how dry the soil is. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the information. I will uh, definitely going to buy that. I product. do have one question. Um, since when you repot it, do you move it up into a bigger pot? Yeah. Okay. That's good. All righty. Thank you. There, and there were no signs of pests on it in, at all? No, during winter uh, time, I can see when I keep the plant inside, uh, I saw some time effects on that, but I spray with neem oil and soap yes. to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And I will wipe that uh, plant. Uh, so yeah, during winter, uh, it, I see the uh, effects on the plant. Okay. It happened every year. Yeah. And so about, I'm just curious about how many months out of the year is the plant outside? Uh, from, I will like when the temperature go in like 60s uh, during uh, like uh, April end, I will put uh -huh. the plant outside and when uh, near about like uh, October, uh, October 15th, I will take the plant inside. Okay, but how about... Before, um, those, those are daytime temperatures, right? Yeah. How about, it's outside all night? Yeah. So oh. at night at 60 can get down into the 40s at some time during this year. And this is, this is a plant that grows in nine, zones nine to 11, which is tropical, subtropical. So I'm just kind of wondering if this plant is getting enough heat, enough time throughout the year. Okay. You know, enough, enough direct sunlight. To get uh, uh, yeah. I've I mean, during winter, I keep that plant in my sunroom. So okay. there are plenty windows, so it can survive. Okay. That's it gets plenty, like good, uh, good amount of sunlight. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for. Um, one yeah. other little, my little two cents also that I read doing research is that this can also possibly be caused by an iron deficiency. Um, I don't know if, if you're just feeding it with compost or if you're giving it any supplemental plant food, but it's possible um, it may need iron. Okay, okay. But uh, if, if I change the soil, so I, I believe there is everything in the new soil pack. Okay. So, okay, uh, but I will try that also. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you can how you can check for that, but um, that was just something that I had researched and that I that I noted that hadn't been. Mentioned. If I put some nail in the pot, that will uh, give some iron to the plant. Put what in the pot? I'm sorry. Nail, nail. Nails. Nails. She's mm -hmm. saying nails. Oh, I I have no idea if it would. Um, you know, the elemental nail would would provide actual nail to the soil. I don't know about that. I would have to I would have to do more research on that. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is also Rashmi's question <laughs> about your um, your uh, bottle gourd and cucumber plants uh, fruits rotting. Mm -hmm. um, I believe uh, you guys might have some more, Larry or, uh, or Linda might have some more questions to her about this. Again, on, on these two plants, we were wondering what your watering regimen is. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
How, how, yeah. how often? Uh, as needed, like a, a week, a twice a week. Even even when it's rained, um, a couple. No, inches. if it's if it's rain, uh, I will not water. I will skip that week. I will not water this plant. Uh, are are the leaves of the plant getting stiff and very prickly? And uh, no. No. Okay. They're getting yellow and they're getting dried brown color. You you so. you may have you may have some mildew. No, there is no, there is no mildew on the plant. Um, After this storm, the plant got like uh, like uh, shaking. Like it's not in a good condition. Maybe too much water, too much rain. Well, that's, that's, that's what, what we were, we're wondering. It, yeah. You, it sounds like you're getting too much water. Yeah. Okay. They are both in full sunlight? Yeah. And are you growing the cukes and the gourds uh, vertically? Uh, no, the, the location is different for both plants. Um, but are you growing them on a trellis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Grow yeah I'm growing, growing, yeah. They're I'm growing on the trellis. Yeah, they're not growing along the ground. No. Okay. Um, she said this getting less sunlight. This year I am facing too much problem in my garden. I am. <laughs> it's an awful lot of rain. We've had an yeah. awful lot of rain. What we were mostly concerned about was the amount of water. Okay. Okay. Now, have you been growing these for the last few years? Uh, almost last five years. In the same place? Uh, no, I changed the place for okay. the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. All right, those were the end of our submitted questions. Um, and I do have a few that were put mm -hmm. into the chat. Um, so let me get here and I will uh, put these out here for our panel to um, ask. Let me see. Um, so Janine White asked um, if anybody has any experience with a rotating compost bin um, and if you have any recommendations or things to avoid. I assume she means the one that tumbles. Uh, I, think, I think that's what she's talking about. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I have one. Does Do you guys have one at all? Mm -hmm. My um, husband tried to make one, but it didn't <laughs> uh, work out so well because it was too heavy and water was able to get into it and we could not turn it. So, so that kind of didn't work out. But I'm assuming this is a um, uh, a store bought uh, variety, right? And I'm looking into. Yes, um, I can tell you about mine if you'd like. We've had ours for probably um, a good twelve to fifteen years, and it's held up. We have had to replace the uh, the trap door on the top because the little. Um, latch broke off, but the company that we got it from, which I can't remember right now, my husband took care of it, um, sent a new lid, just the lid, so we didn't have to buy a whole new composter. Um, but it has, it's, it's round, um, it, it rolls, it has, it's on a little stand. And the really, the thing that I really like about it is the, the liquid from the compost drains out the bottom into the tray, which has a screw top. So when the liquid gets down there, we can pour it out and I actually use that as a kind of a food for my plants, um, diluted. I don't use it full strength. So I dilute it, put it in a watering can and use that to feed plants. So that's, that's a feature I really like about it. Um, I'm not a composting guru, but we do use like a three-step system. So we have um, a kitchen composter. From the kitchen composter, it goes into the rotating one. And then when that gets full, it goes into our, um, big we have a big open bin made out of pallets actually and that's like the final step where it gets um continued to mix in and turned in with bigger scraps and that kind of thing until it's actually ready to go into the garden because the 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 round composter will get full before that compost is is finished 
That's mm -hmm. the problem with it. It's not big enough to hold compost all the way to the finished stage. And also you can't really put worms in there because it gets really, really hot inside there. Um, so the worms, we have our composting worms in our final um, bin to finish the, the breakdown. Um, I'm not sure what brand it is we have, um, but uh, Janine, if you're uh, interested, I can uh, look that up and, and uh, get back to you later. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the next question is um, from Michelle Butler. Um, she says her previously pro productive tomato plants are looking dead now. Uh, so uh, this sounds like a good question for uh, Larry, Leslie, and Linda to talk about. Um, so Michelle, if you're here and you want to unmute yourself, uh, we can open up this discussion. Okay, hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Sure. Michelle, what kind of tomatoes are they, do you know? Um, yeah, we have quite, we have a variety. A lot of them are cherry, like small cherry and mm -hmm. uh, plum ones, but we have like Butter Boy and uh, an heirloom hybrid, uh, or heirloom, it's like a purple uh -huh. um, one. But they all seem to be doing equally terrible. <laughs> Are they planted in the same place as they were last year? Uh, no, we rotated. I learned that early on in this class. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we did put them in new spots this year. Um, and we do have a um, cover down over all of the garden, but it's mm -hmm. permeable. And we usually haven't had issues with it as far as like it being too moist or too hot underneath. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if that might be what the problem is. Yeah, the heat has made a big difference this year. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. T tomatoes, uh, as you, um, you likely know, um, are, they kind of like to get regularly watered, but not over watered. So yeah. if you went away for a week for vacation, and nobody watered your tomatoes, you're going to see a difference. Um, so how do you water? OK. So that could cause them to just keel over like they have? I mean, well, like this is turning brown, lose the leaves. Yeah, how, how, how do you water? How often do you water? Well, we were watering, I mean, I would say once a week, maybe twice a week, because we had had regular rain right. at the beginning of the season. Right. Um, and when you water once a week, and there's no rain in between. Is it a is it a drenching? I mean, yeah, it's for 40 minutes. We water for 40 minutes. And then they don't get any water for a week, unless it rains. Uh, unless it rains, correct. Okay, I, I'd recommend that you water on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. Like every three you, days, you mean, or on a regular basis? I, I don't water. We grow tomatoes too. Uh, okay. I don't, Leslie and I don't water our tomatoes every day. Right. But we do water them several times a week. Probably, I'd say, on the average of about four times a week. But we, oh, use, okay. a drip, we use a drip nest system because the water should go to the roots, not to the plant, because um, you're going to get some fungus off that. The other question is, um, do you feed the plants? No. Yeah, that um, could be the problem. They take a lot out of the soil. Uh, yeah. Tomato plants, almost any kind of tomato, they're a real hound for calcium. And I learned the hard way years ago growing tomatoes. Um, the, the, what has been successful for us, we believe, using a bone meal. It comes in a bag, it's, it's finely ground, and you just have to scratch it a little in in the soil. You get it, and it's a small amount um, for each plant, and you, you, you uh, scrape it in and then water on top of it. So it works its way down. We do it about every two to three weeks. Every two to three weeks? Okay. Yeah, and that yeah. seems to help the plant. Um, now, the other choice some people use is crushed eggshells. That's great. They work, but they're a lot slower. So that's something okay, you yeah. put in, in the off season in the location that you're going to plant the tomatoes. Yeah, we did do that. Yeah, we did that at the beginning. We put eggshells in um, yeah. as we were planting them, but that was like a one and done sort of thing. Right, yeah. right. I, I did put like some antacid um, pills, 
probably it was before they had any uh, blossoms or fruit. Mm -hmm. But other than that, like that's all we did. So I definitely will get some bone meal to add to it then. Right. Um, yeah. So something um, I'm just listening. Something I was thinking too. Because my tomatoes are having a similar problem, you know, but we got six inches of rain during the, when the tornado came through. So I don't know what, you know, your location is, but, you know, we got so much rain that my tomatoes, you know, they they look horrible, but it yeah. could be the splashback, you know, so if you, you know, like he was talking about, you know, misting or, or using a drip, yeah, using a drip irrigation, you know, you got that rain that's just pounding down and then you get all this splashback on the underside of the leaves, especially... Yeah. If it's um, kind of starting at the bottom and going to the top, you know, that's definitely could be a, a, a fungal issue you've got going on there too. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, we got oodles definitely. of rain as well, at least six inches. Yeah, Megan, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, we, that, those heavy rains, especially when the, when the, the uh, res, residue of the hurricane uh, hit us, um, that really wreaked havoc with our tomatoes, our green peppers, and our squash. We lost several of our squash because they just drowned. The, yeah, the, roots, right. it, the roots it literally drown, drown. If you know a big storm is coming and you're inclined to want to do it, I've seen some uh, uh, home gardeners, they'll put down some plastic underneath the plants. It's kind of a pain to do, but it'll cause the water to run off if you run off and, and dissipate. And that way the plants, the, the roots to the plants don't get um, submerged in water for days. The soil was already fairly saturated yeah. when, when that storm came through. Right. Okay, mine, those are some great ideas. Thank you. Yeah, I had mine in raised beds, and uh, they're they're doing okay when the squirrels don't steal them. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but I put I put mulch around underneath them to keep the splash from coming up to the to the leaves, and that seemed to help considerably. That's a good idea. Okay, we have a, a, another question from Claire. Um, she says three of her pepper plants are really small and they haven't grown more than a foot tall. So uh, um, Claire, if you wanna um, unmute yourself and you can ask uh, our vegetable people your question. Yeah, I, I have five uh, red bell pepper plants and um, Two of them have gotten about three feet tall, um, and the other three are no more than a foot tall. And uh, each of them has put out um, a pepper about, I can go get one, actually, I'm, I'm sort of backwards here, about um, this big, maybe, maybe a two inch <coughs> bell pepper. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, like a mini pep, mini size, you know, they're not full grown peppers. They're good, uh, but they're, uh, they're not growing to full size. Uh, I, and I don't know why the plants aren't growing to full height. Have you grown have any ideas? Claire, have you grown this variety before? Um, I believe I have. I had trouble getting them started. I lost the peppers a couple of times and had to go rebuy more peppers. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, they, they, batch. Peppers are, can be a challenge. They, mm -hmm. they love hot weather, but if it gets too hot, they won't set fruit. If it gets too cool, they won't set fruit. Mm -hmm. um, we have four plants this year. Megan, are you listening? Not there. Okay, Carla, yes. these are these are plants that came from the Master Gardener sale that we didn't have. They're small, they're only two feet uh, tall, but they're all four of them are producing like gangbusters. But not big. Not not real big, yeah. but the wall on them is is nice size. Yeah. But they uh, stay small. And if you let it, let the green pepper go long enough and right. timing it right, you'll you'll get a red one. They'll end up going that way before, but sometimes they get root rot or get the um, black spot on them before then. Um, but, the, but but I've also seen pepper plants that are four feet tall. Just not this year. So the the production 
and ours and ours waned pretty badly for about four or five days mm -hmm. after the heavy rains, but they bounced back. Um, yeah, I this year I've never had them this small before. Yeah, that mm -hmm. two of them are about uh, the height of my um, my braces, which are maybe right. three feet tall. And the other three are really no more than a foot tall, but they have put out a, uh, a tomato that's, I mean, a pepper that's about a good two inch round red pepper. What did you grow there last year in that spot? I grew peppers there last year. And the year before that? Tomatoes. Okay. Um, and. And I had to switch it because I don't have that large a garden and I grow cucumbers on that side. I have a trellis on that side mm. and it became a jungle with the tomatoes <laughs> and the cucumbers mm -hmm. on the same side of the garden. Right. So I, I, I just really couldn't get to anything. So I moved the tomatoes to the other side, but I do alternate the varieties of tomatoes where they are. Uh, so that I don't grow the same kind of tomato in the same spot. I, I, I keep track of what tomato was in which spot each year so that I don't grow the same one in the same spot. Um, uh, but, Claire, um, toma tomatoes and peppers, peppers. and eggplants, eggplants, all of those are in the nightshade family. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and they have they all have, can have problems with what we call root knot nematodes, which are in the soil. Um, that's the reason that you shouldn't plant them in the same spot year after year. And since peppers and, and tomatoes and eggplants and those kinds of things are all in the same family, um, you shouldn't plant anything in that group of things in the same place. So if it's possible to rotate that with, um, with your, your cucumbers, maybe move the trellis or build a new trellis next time, you might have better luck. There's, there's another option you might look into as well if you have a very limited garden space is look into grow bags. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the pepper plants, um, tomato plants, and uh, cucumbers do well in grow bags. Mm -hmm. What are grow bags? Uh, they're kind of, it's not burlap, but they're, they're made out of uh, recycled plastic and it's a fabric. And it's, it, you can get them in varying sizes. They're porous, so water can go through them, they drain. Um, and you put a mixture of potting soil and some other elements, other ingredients in there and you plant these plants in the grow bags. But the nice thing about it is you can pick them up and move them. So if you have an area, like with me, I have very limited sun, but I don't want to plant the same plants in the same area all the time. So I will plant them the next time in grow bags. They'll be in the same area, but they're not going to be in the soil. And I'll have something else growing around their flowers or something like that. So it, it gives you a chance to rest your soil for two to three years before you come back with it. Now, we, we make our own compost and we put two to three inches of new compost in that soil every year. Does that make a difference? No, it's like what Debbie was saying is you, you have pests and viruses and diseases that if you plant, same thing with the arborvitae plants. If you plant the same thing in the same place all the time, you're asking for trouble. You, you have to rotate them out. Uh, the cucumbers do not fall into that category. The cucumbers no, they're are in a different, they're in a different family. The right. cucumbers, squash uh, are, are, are in one family. The mm -hmm. tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants are in another family. Mm -hmm. So how do I, I, I don't understand how this bag stands up. How, how do you? Well, it's, it's a good uh, almost two feet tall and it's, it's circular and it's got a flat bottom. If, if you like, I can get you some information on it um, afterwards. I've yeah. done a workshop on it, but it, it works really well if you have limited space or limited sun. And you put the compost into the bag? Well, you're gonna mix this all up before you even put the plants in there. But you, 
but you put it in the same garden, but you put the compost and the soil into the bag. bag. And you put it anywhere you want. Yeah, you can put it any place you want. You can put it on, I've had them on my patio. So. Yeah, the only, the only thing about the grow bags, Claire, is you have to make sure that you um, water them because they dry out a lot faster they than do. things in the ground because the water will run right out. Um, I use them, they stand up fine. Um, once you have soil in them, you know, they won't, it's like, it's like a grocery, like a reusable grocery bag almost. That's the comparable thing. And actually people have said that you can use those reusable grocery bags as that. So mostly they have um, handles and you can pick them up and move them around. Um, but once they're filled, then they stand up straight because the soil holds them up. And then they also do have uh, catch trays that you can you can put underneath them if, for example, it's you're having a very hot, hot, dry season, you can put the trays underneath the grow bags and they will help retain the water instead of it running all the way out too quickly. So there's a lot of different options. So uh, the bag will absorb the water from the tray. Yes, uh-huh. It'll actually drink the water up from the bottom. <clears throat> right, because all of my plants are doing very well now, you know, but they're getting their water from the soil. And, um, and I, you know, I, I've been careful not to plant varieties like the brandy wine that's a, uh, um, uh, it's coarse bag. Mm. what do you call it? A, a, not a hybrid tomato, but a, uh, Heirloom. An heirloom, because I know that the heirlooms will have more trouble with being with the nematodes than than mm -hmm. hybrids do. The hybrids aren't the hybrids bred not to have trouble with nematodes. Well, some of them are. Yeah. Um. yeah. If you get a package of tomatoes and it says, um, I think it's like V F in or something or VNF on the label. I forgot the order, but those mm -hmm. are bred to be resistant to. Uh, um, I forgot the, the different diseases and one of those, the N stands for nematodes. <clears throat> well, but does that have to do with why the peppers didn't grow tall or does it have to do with the weather this year? It could be everything. And peppers also don't like their feet wet very long either. Nope. 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 The heat, is that what you heat. said? Their, their feet, the roots. they don't like their roots wet for a long period of time. So you have a lot of different weather conditions, plus you haven't really rotated your garden. So it could be a composite of a whole bunch of things that, that are causing your plants not to thrive. Yeah, they've only been there two years though. I mean. Claire, have you done a, have you done a uh, soil test in the last couple of years? No, I haven't. Again, a good idea. Mm -hmm. I do have one of those um, metal, uh, pan tools that you can use to measure the um, acidity in your soil. Well, it's, it's not quite the same as getting a good soil test, though. Um, That's not going to tell you what kind of mm -hmm. minerals uh, are, and calcium and such are in the soil, mm -hmm. only how acid it is. Yeah. And which, in which ones, what minerals you don't have enough of. And, and as far as fertilizer, I've been using 10, 10, 10 once a month. Mm -hmm. um, but shouldn't I use a higher second number for if I really want fruit? There again, you should be getting a soil test because you, you could be putting way too much of something like phosphorus or something like that into your soil and you, mm -hmm. and you might not need that. You really should get a soil test. Okay, well. You may only need to put nitrogen in there and not, nothing else. Yeah. And, and instead you're adding too much of the other chemical or elements that you don't really need to have in there. And this area is, is notorious for a lot of phosphorus in the soil, so. Uh, is, it too late, is it too late to get a soil test this year? No, mm. I don't think so. Megan? They do it all year long. Yeah. How long does it take? About a week and a half. I mean, it's about, they're about three weeks out now. I mean, now it's going to be too late to affect your plants for this year, but it could help you have a better understanding of your soil 
for next year. Yeah. And, and and they'll tell me what I need to add to the soil in terms yeah, of my yeah. fertilizer. You, you tell them what yeah, you're there's, growing. There's a form. Yeah, there's a form you fill out and you just say, you know, you're growing like, like mixed vegetables and you want to turn it into a mixed vegetable plot again. And, uh, you know, they'll write the recommendations to you as if, you know, that's what you're <clears throat> growing next year. Okay. Pretty easy to do. Yeah. That would be helpful. Okay. okay. Um, are we ready to go on? Did you get your answer, Claire? Are we ready to go on to the next question? Yeah, I had another one I haven't written out, but I'm sure there's other people waiting. Yeah, we'll come back to you, okay? Just put it in the chat box and then we'll put it in the order that we, they were received. Um, so the next question is actually, um, this was emailed, this picture was emailed to us, but it didn't uh, get here in time for me to get it on the PowerPoint. Um, but we had a picture sent in of some okra plants that had some spots and some, uh, uh, it was a little bit hard to tell whether or not it could have been uh, some aphids or possibly a disease. Um, so uh, if you want to unmute yourself, and I know Linda was, um, looking into this for you, uh, maybe you can, she can ask you questions about your okra. Is she there? Uh, yeah, I think so. Hi. Uh, I had sent a picture of okra and asked about what the problem is. And uh, I think you are referring to me, probably my okra yes. section. Okay. Yes. So um, all of those uh, buds, the small buds that were coming up, they showed black flecks on them, almost like sp spores of some sort. And uh, suddenly I saw that all of the okra, you know, row had that problem. And I wasn't sure what it is because I looked around. I mean, I searched the literature uh, south and every place else. And, uh, you know, I could not find a definitive answer. All I could determine was it was an okra blight as far as I could tell. Uh, but if it is okra bl uh, blight, then what's the mitigation? I mean, what should I be? Well, did you do when you were talking about the, the the black flecks did you notice if if they were moving no they were not moving okay were there any ants on the plant no they were not no ants okay there is a a, a fungus i think it's called and let's see let me see if i can find it because i don't have it in my memory but that causes that. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find it, Linda. Xenophora yeah. or something like that. Is that the name? I'm trying to find it now. Let's see here. Oh gosh, I can't find it. Can okay. you find I've it? Got, I've got it here, Linda. Hold on. Hold okay. On one okay. Second. It begins with a C. Yeah, Xenophora. Is that the name? Yes. Okay, yeah. so okay. It is, if it is kinophora, but then what is the mitigation? What should be done to remediate this business? Because the plants are tall enough and they started to have good blooms on them. And then the okra was forming uh, <laughs> at this late at season. I don't want to lose the okra produce. <laughs> yeah, Linda, what you had sent to me was that um, the spots may be the result of a pathogen, Cercospora albomosi. Yeah, that's why fungal, I don't have it. <laughs> a fungal infection. Yeah, you didn't have that in your head. No. <laughs> a fungal infection wherein spores are carried by the wind from infected plants to other plants. Mm. These spores adhere to the leaf surface and grow, becoming mycelia growth. Right. That's what your answer had been earlier. And I don't know what fungicide would work for it. Larry, do you know? Um, no, I'd have to. I'd have to look it up. I saw that on there I, when I was looking for causes because I'm, I'm looking at it on my phone. the The first picture, um, the one that's got the the cluster of buds that have got yes. a calm, 
one of the first thoughts I had was uh, insect insect frack. Yeah, um, that's a good count. If, if, if you go to the second one, I didn't see this when I looked at it a couple hours ago, but you go to the second one and you zoom in on it, there's actually uh, a gardener's blade or something in the picture. Looks like a might be a Purple. pair of snips or something. Um, and next to it, it looks to me like the shell of a very small insect. There's two of them there. Hmm. For anybody who still has the pictures. Yeah, I don't, I can't get to it on my phone. I have the picture, but it's, it's, I can't tell. Um, yeah, you have to zoom in to see it. Yeah, it looks at like possibly at the base where the buds are. Is that where you're right. talking about? Yes, it? yes. Yeah. There's, it looks like some kind of insect there. Um, Next to that saw blade or whatever that is. Oh yeah, I see what you're talking about. I think that might be a leaf, but um, I, I see what I see the thing that does look huh? like insect, mm -hmm. but it's hard to tell. Actually, the one picture was kind of fuzzy, and the other one was clearer. Right. But I sent both of them just so that you know you'll have some idea. Yeah, we're looking at the the one that's fuzzy. At uh -huh. the bottom, it has, if you look at the bottom of it, where, below the fuzzy part, mm -hmm. it looks like there might be a couple of bugs attached to the, the base of where the, the buds are. Right. Okay. So I can't, I mean, I can't tell what kind of bugs they are from no, here. No, I can't either. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. it could even be a snail. I don't know. I've no, that is snail. too small for that. Is if, it? Okay, if it, if it is a fungus, if it's that leaf spot, then the there there are several different kinds of fungicides that you can use, but they should all contain chlorothalonil, thalonil, nil, um, and then there's a couple other chemicals that I can't produce either can pronounce <laughs> either. But we can get you the names of the chemicals if okay. you if you would like those. We can't recommend a particular product, but we can tell you what chemicals the product should contain. Okay. 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 And, uh, can, and those can be used on vegetables? Uh, that's what it says. Uh, I, I would I would have to read it to be to be honest with you. Okay. I, I'm just pulling this up on my cell phone here. That's what it looks like. We have to research it a little further just to be sure. I, I really don't have the ability to do that on this phone. Sure. Is this is this black coloration on on all of your buds? Now it is on most of the buds. Yes, I mean all the uh, okra plants have to some degree. Have you tried Have you tried to hose it off? Yes, I have. And it hasn't come off. I can just take a little, you know, paper towel and kind of remove that maybe. Is it sticky? No. No? No. No, I didn't see any mycelium or anything. I mean, if there was a mycelium, I would be able to. Yeah. yeah. At least, uh, you know, be able Wait to. Little. Yeah. OK. Um, well, well, we'll pursue that uh, a little bit further and we'll get back to you. We have your email so we can uh, sure. email you. Okay, no problem. Things. Um, uh, we have another question from Michelle Butler. Um, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, she said she would like to plant a nice tree in the center of an open yard to provide shade and a bird refuge. Um, and food for good bugs. Um, what species would you suggest for a full sun area? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I know that we, we're gardeners, we're talking gardens here, but I thought since I had all these experts, <laughs> maybe if you could suggest some trees, I would just certainly appreciate it. Trees, are part, of, trees are part of a garden. <laughs> okay, great. How much room are you dealing with? Uh, we have about an acre and a half, and literally, like, we have no trees in the yard, except for one failing apple tree. Well, so you're talking about a, what we call a specimen tree. It's a single tree that, that your eye goes to? Yep. And you want to put this in your front yard? Uh, in the backyard, yeah. In, in the backyard? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Carla, uh, others? I mean, you could, 
there's a lot of different types of maples. I mean, we, we uh, espouse native plants, which includes trees. Yes. And there's, yes, a awful I, lot I, to, there's a lot to choose from. But it depends on, on, the, on mm -hmm. what you want. Like if I put an oak tree out there, you're going you're gonna to have squirrels in a few years, probably. Yeah. That That's it. Well, and they're, slow, and they're slow growing as well, right? The oak. Yeah, some are, some aren't. Uh, I've got a swamp oak, oak out back that's probably growing at least a 12 to 15 inches a year. Oh, and, wow. Okay. And it's got acorns on it, and I've grown, I've, I, I have a second generation of, of trees coming off of those acorns. <laughs> Would you call it a swamp oak? Yeah, swamp oak. Okay. Okay. Uh, just just as an example, but there's a lot of maple. Yeah. yeah. Um, Red maples do well. Uh, there's evergreens. I think my my first thought was, uh, you know, my first thought was definitely an oak. You know, oak brings a lot of uh, good insects and and squirrels as well, and they provide a lot of shade. Um, there's a bunch of different varieties of oak that you can look yep. into. Um, okay. There is Usually a good. Hard. I don't know if you. Where the, there's a list of um, of good tree, you know, native trees. I think the Delaware Native Plant Society puts it out. Um, but you know, okay. that'd be a good place to start. You know, with um, you know some native trees in the area. I love redbud. You know, redbud is a nice tree. It stays small, so it's not the best for you know a shade tree. Yeah. Um, but definitely the oak realm is is where I think you should go. I mean, if you if you care for squirrels and you know acorns and things like that. Yeah, I don't, a, I don't mind them. <laughs> they, have, they have a nice spread. Uh, they're, they don't have too many enemies, uh, disease or otherwise. Do you have deer in your area? Uh, they're afraid to come in the yard. We, uh, there's a lot of sp spare hunters around, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I say that for two reasons. Deer like acorns. Oh, okay. So they will come if they, if they smell acorns. Oh, and and, and right. that's, that's okay because you're not going to want all the acorns that, that a mature oak will produce. But you also you don't want to lure deer into your yard either. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> it's any tree you put in your backyard, I would recommend you put a, a chicken wire mesh about four feet up on it around the trunk for the first four or five years. Because if you do have any deer that wander in there and they're bucks, they're going to rip up that, that uh, trunk when they're uh, growing their antlers. Ah, okay. If they did it to a couple of ours. Yeah, they'll rub their ankles. Okay. Yeah. My neighbor uh, planted uh, a couple of dogwoods a couple of years ago, and that first winter, they just tore them up. Yeah. Okay, I would not have thought of that. Thank you very much. But the, the, the there's there's Megan's, Megan's idea is a good one. The, the uh, no, Delaware Native, Native Society, their Native Plant Society, their Native Plant yep. Society um, there, you'll you'll not only see the names of the plant of the trees, of course, say the oak family or the maple family or whatever, but it'll give you the the characteristics like how tall is it going to get. You may not want an oak that grows 120 feet tall. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. It depends on how big your backyard is. Uh, so. Uh, right. Do you, you have any power lines? Yeah. Right. Got it. Okay. All right. There's a lot of lots of flowers. Good book, um, a great resource you might want to think about. It's called uh, Delaware Trees, and it's written by the the Delaware Forest Service put it out. Um, I think the last issue was in 2012. Um, but you know, it I, I think it's a pretty awesome book. It helps identify trees if you're going on a nature walk or what have you as well. Um, you know, but I definitely look into that. I think if you call the Delaware Department of Agriculture, they will actually. Uh, I think they give them away, so it might be huh. worth it to check that out. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Anyone suggest a red bud tree? Oh, that's a nice one, too. Yeah, we I like red bud. Did. Uh, red buds are my favorite, but she really wants one for shade. And, yeah, and you I, won't get that. I wouldn't necessarily. Yeah, we were thinking really a little bigger than red bud tree. I get a lot of shade for my red buds, and they grow fast. Uh, do you, um, Claire, do you live anywhere near? Um, or have you ever heard of Bombay Hook? Nature is a nature reserve. Did she leave? Claire? I think we were talking. We were talking to Michelle. Oh, I thought it was Claire <laughs> on the tree. No, that was no, Michelle's on the tree. Yeah, oh, that was on the tree. Sorry, yeah. Michelle. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Yeah, I actually volunteer. <laughs> Used to volunteer okay, at Bombay uh, Hook. I'm holding up a book, Megan. We have these. Were you talking to me? Yeah. No. Talking to me. Michelle? No, I'm talking to Megan. Sorry, Claire. Michelle. Can you read that? 
Uh, yes, kind of. Let's see, native trees for wildlife habitat. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got that at Bombay? It's put up by the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it's another good resource, and I, I said Bombay because I know they have them over there. Okay. Well, I can pick, I'll look for those then. Yeah, because I volunteer there, so. Definitely. You want Great. a large Thank you. tree or a small tree? Well, I, we were thinking a large tree. Okay, because I've got witch hazels, which are nice. They bloom in February. Hmm, witch hazel? About okay. Month. Yeah, I've got several of those. I'll give you one. I've got red buds <laughs> too. But they stay pretty small, the witch hazel. Pretty small. Um, you know, no, it's, it's not, the, not necessarily it, like that large tree. It won't get, a witch hazel won't get to, a, it's a large shrub, actually, or a small tree. But it won't get as big as big as an oak would. But it gives shade. Has pretty leaves. Has it gives shade, and so does redbud. Dogwoods I don't recommend because they have a disease that's going around the east coast, so they don't stay pretty very long. But there are there are lots of trees. All right, you definitely have given me some great ideas. Thanks. Okay, um, we're going to go on to the next question. Um, I want to try to get all of these in before we run out of time and people start abandoning us. Um, Janine had a question about cover crops. Um, she wanted to know if uh, anyone would recommend a cover crop for the raised beds. Mm. Which means something that she can plow in or cultivate in later on? Um, I would assume so. That's, I mean, I plant crimson clover in mine and I, and I till it under um, before I'm, you know, a few weeks before. Maybe, so. I was, I was going to suggest that because that's, that's beautiful when it blooms. Yes. Um, but I know there are a lot of options for cover crops out there. So if anybody has a, has a different idea, I've tried different things, but I've had the best success with crimson clover. Rye grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah growing too. So like yeah, if you wanted to clover. keep something lower growing, it does do something for that. And buckwheat, buckwheat's another one that um that people tend to, to overlook sometimes. Um it, it's a medium height plant that, that does well. Thank you. Okay. Um and then someone asked if this was being recorded, and yes, it is being recorded. And I believe Megan put the link to uh, where we keep those recordings um, in, on the Delaware Master Gardeners page on the um, Delaware State University website. So um, there, it takes a little bit of time after something's recorded to actually get it there, as you can understand with technology and everything. And um, But it does get there eventually. So if you check back there, um, you can find it also. Uh, recordings of all of our previous workshops since we started doing them on Zoom are available there. Um, at this point, um, Carol Steinbrecher, who asked the original question about um, the uh, tree to plant in her yard, the very first question. Um, she oh, she was looking for mountainous. Yep, she's here now. She was a little bit late joining us, um, but um, I would like to go back um, and address that for her because I know you guys had some questions for her. So I'm going to try to see if I can get back to that um, to that slide. Whoops! I'm going to have to go back one by one. Sorry. Make us all dizzy looking at the slides fly by. Bye bye. I believe it was the first question. Okay. Um, yeah, Carol, if you're still here, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, we can talk about your um, tree for your backyard. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we had some discussion about this earlier before you got here um, and some different recommendations. Um, Wendy had suggested a winterberry holly, which you have to have more than one of, so we're not really sure whether you want one tree or more than one. Um, and well, then- no, Martha, let, let me, Debbie, let me just correct that a little bit. Okay. But Delaware has many, many holly trees and it doesn't have to be in the immediate vicinity. It could be, 
you know, next door or down the road even. But as long as there's one in that vicinity somewhere, it doesn't have to be in her garden. But they are dioecious, so it does take a male and a female. Okay. So that was one of the recommendations. Um, I believe Carla um, and Larry had some other recommendations. So um, if you want to tell her about that, guys. Yeah, I was recommending uh, that you might want an amelanchier, uh, also known as a service berry or okay. a shad blow. Uh, they're, they grow to about 20, 25 feet normally. Uh, they do produce berries that uh, birds really like. Um, it's a very pretty little tree. They okay. bloom uh, before the dogwoods. Uh, they bloom white. And uh, they make a nice little tree. And it's okay. a native. Great. Yeah, I'm trying to keep everything native in my new little yard. Right. And I'd like to have things that attract the birds you know, in the winter, like if the berries would stay on for a couple of months anyway. Right. Well, the yep. winterberry does. Now the mountain ash will grow between 20 and 30 feet in size. Which one grows 20 to 30 feet? The winterberry holly? No, the mountain ash that you were asking about. Oh, okay. But she was having some concerns, um, mm -hmm. Wendy, about uh, the mountain ash uh, having problems. Um, with having problems with what? Yeah, it's well, not, not a native and it's a it's a zone four or five tree. Right. It does much better in the higher altitudes. Well, if you get the American mountain ash, that's good from zone two to nine. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll look into it. I'm going to look up that service berry because that's definitely native and for this zone. Right. Yeah. So they thank you very much for your... here. Great. Thank you. Sure. Definitely. Okay. Um, some other questions we had. Um, back to Claire. Um, she said she found a few tomato leaves on one plant um, that had what she thinks is powdery mildew and they died. Um, and she said she took a few more um, pictures. Um, Claire, if you could email that to us, we can look at that later. Um, but do you guys want to talk to her about um, powdery mildew at all? Well, I think considering all the rain we've had, it's quite possible. It's just from dampness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what do you do to stop it from spreading to other plants? Stop watering them. <laughs> yeah, once you've got powdery yeah. mildew, there's not much you can do about it. It's not going to kill the plant. You can prevent it from happening by spraying with milk and water. With Before you get doing what? What can I do to stop it? Stop with the powdery do mildew from spreading? Milk. Well, you can't do much to stop it from spreading because it's once you've got it, it's there. But you can't do much about it once you've got it, mm. unfortunately. Will neem oil help? No. 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 It won't no. kill a plant, Claire. It's just unsightly to some people. Yeah, it's just unsightly. It's not going to kill your plant. It, well, a few of the leaves turned brown and died, but um, the rest of the plant is quite healthy. Right. Well, tomatoes can be very sensitive to a lot of rain, a lot of water. They get a lot of problems. Mm. And you've got to admit we've had plenty of rain this year, more than usual. Mm -hmm. So I would think it's probably more than likely that it's the rain that's the problem with your tomatoes. What do you think? Yeah. Leslie and Larry. Yeah, we had a, uh, Wendy, we had a pretty good conversation with Claire about the tomatoes uh, earlier before you- Oh, did you? Dived in, so unless Claire's got some other questions. Okay. And uh, Claire has another question actually. Um, she says she's been battling wits with a looper all summer who's trying to steal all of her kale. Um, and every few days she has to pull eggs and caterpillars off the leaves. Um, you can't keep neem oil on it because it keeps raining. And uh, she has seen little white butterflies flying around. 
Um, what did you say, Wendy? Have you seen little white butterflies flying around? Yeah, that's the looper, but I've only seen one and I have a butterfly net and I haven't been able to catch it. And I was wondering <laughs> if you had any other ideas. Can, can, you, no. can, you net the, can you net the affected plants? Yeah, would a floating row cover or something like that be effective? Yeah, that would help because it lets the light in, it lets the water in. Yep. It would keep that away from laying eggs on, on the plants, absolutely. Um, where would I get one of those? Floating row cover, it comes in a roll. Um, well, we used to have a place called Agway that was the, good. The, 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 a lot of the, the uh, nurseries around here have them. Uh, the big boxes have them. We bought them. Uh, it, you can get them in rolls, like Wendy said. We've also bought them. They, they come folded up. Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're in different sizes. Very, very lightweight. You're careful yeah, you get more than one year out of them. Right. So, uh, say a garden center or yeah. even online would probably be work out okay. And the sun still gets through it? Yeah. Yes. And it also, if you want a late crop, if you put it on before a frost, it will actually keep the frost off your plants too. Yeah. I and I kale does leaf. pretty well, e even in a frost. I mean, I've had kale mm -hmm. last well into the fall. Um, but um, how do you stake it up above the plant level? You don't want it laying on the plant, do you? No. Make some hoops. Make some hoops. Make some hoops. Yeah, like metal hoops that uh, it sits on top of. You can use PVC too, some PVC type. Right. And uh, Claire, I actually just, um, I have um, lettuces that I, ke I kept all winter last year. They, they survived through the whole winter with a row cover. And I just put little, um, those little bamboo skinny stakes along the sides of my bed. I put the row cover on top of it and I used those old fashioned wooden uh, clothespins. Yeah. And flip it onto the, the stakes and I didn't have to spend any extra money. Um, and then when I wanted to harvest some of the least lettuce, I just unplugged the clothespin, peeled it back, picked my lettuce, and then put it back on and put the clothespin back on. Easy cheesy. So, If you have a willow tree, you can also make your hoops with the willows. Mm -hmm. So you use uh, bamboo stakes and just bent them over? Yeah. Is that um, what you're saying? I didn't, I didn't bend mine. I just used the short ones and put them straight in. And then I just used that to hold up the cover. So it was not, right. it was not curved. It was just flat like this. And then I just take the clothespin off and take it out. And it was, it, it held up through all weather, you know, all kinds of weather and everything that way. Speaking of lettuces, that was uh, my next question I hadn't written in the chat box yet. I was getting ready to plant my fall lettuce and I was wondering if, if my, uh, and, and my fall peas and I was wondering if this was a good time. We've already yeah. got ours in. What'd yeah. you say? So we've already got ours in. Yeah. Lettuce, spinach, peas, beans, yeah. um, and I'm gonna be carrots. Any, any time now when I get done with all this stuff, I'm gonna go plant mine. It's not too late. Last year I planted them in September and they were fine, so. Good, that's my afternoon project. <laughs> that's a big project. Um, and then uh, Carol wanted to know, uh, Larry, what the name of that book was you held up again. Um, oh. you wanna t if you wanna type it in the chat box, everybody yeah. can see it, or if you hold it up, I'll try to type it in here so everybody can see it. I'll type it in. Okay. And I don't, I don't see any other questions that we haven't already answered. Um, does anybody else have any questions or did I miss you at all? Quick question. I didn't have time to write it in the chat. On the recording, when it does become available, will the chat info be there as well? Or should I scribe down what he's going to put in there now for that book? Um, Megan? Yeah, I would, I, would, I would write it down. The uh, The chat part will not be in the uh, recording. That's one thing about these question and answers that all the chat information isn't, isn't published. Thank you. 
If you um, click on the dots next to file, there's an option for save chat and it, then you can save it to your, um, you can save it to a file on your computer. Thank you. Teaching me more than gardening stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know and they keep in, and there's so much to learn in Zoom and then they, every time you think you know it all, they go back and update it and change something, so. <laughs> Um, I don't see any new, any other new questions. Um, and I believe Larry, um, are you going to put the name, you're putting the name of the book in the chat? I, I am. I'm done. How do I get it there? <laughs> Enter. Yeah, I did that and it didn't do anything. Hmm. I'm not on the screen anymore. Hmm. Um, what's the name of it? There I'll it is. Oh, did it come in? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so there, the name of the book um, that he was showing about uh, trees, when we had the tree question um, and had the information about that, this is the book that he held up, the name of the book, if you didn't catch that. Um, I know it, on these little teeny tiny screens, it's a little bit hard to see everything, especially if your eyesight is as bad as mine. Um, and then uh, Janine just asked if there's going to be a garden planning calendar workshop in the fall. Um, Janine, I can tell you that there's not going to be one in the fall, but we are going to try to get one for you in the winter session, probably early winter. So um, the fall workshops are coming out soon. Um, we are not doing, unfortunately, this Ask a Master Gardener workshop for fall, um, but we will do a Ask a Master Gardener session uh, in the winter, so um, to help people plan their gardens for, for uh, 2021. Um, so that, that will be coming up. Keep checking your email and check also check the, uh, the uh, Dell State website and the University of Delaware website for all that information about new workshops. And like I said, the fall workshops are um, going to be available. You'll get an email or they'll be posted probably within the next week or so. So uh, you can start registering for fall workshops. And, uh, and again, they will all be on Zoom. We're not allowed to have uh, live workshops yet, unfortunately, because that, that limit, limits us to what we can do. I love yeah. doing workshops where I could give away stuff or have people taste things and that kind of thing. So it can't really do that over Zoom. So we're, we're limited, but we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. So we hope you guys come back and stick with us for um, future workshops. Um, um, I just learned that little Zoom trick last week where you go down to the end of chat and did everybody find that where it says <laughs> file and there's three dots next to it. Click on those and, um, and it says save chat. Yep. Anybody can do that. Um, we also had another question um, from uh, Carol. She wants to know if there's a um, Master Gardener native plant sale planned for the fall. Um, not for fall, but Carla, are we having, what are we doing for spring? It's a little up in the air at this point because unfortunately the date that we normally have our sale uh, has kind of been taken over. Um, so we're working on trying to find another date uh, to hold it. And hopefully everything will be a go and we'll be able to do this next year. Yep, we're only allowed to do what we're allowed to do and we're uh, trying to be safe and uh, do everything the right way. So um, if everything is, is going better in the world next spring, we can go <coughs> our plant sale. And if we need to wait longer, then we'll be waiting longer. Um, yep. It kind of all depends on uh, whether COVID is over and things get back to somewhat normal and uh, there's a lot of variables, but yep. we will get, keep you posted. Yep, keep checking back with us. Um, so uh, with that, um, thanks everybody for coming. 
Um, here's just a little information. If you want to write any of this down, um, we are virtually manning the uh, Kent County Master Gardener helpline um, and you can call at this number and I think right now, Megan, we're still leaving messages, but uh, they're working on a, a way to make this uh, where people can actually answer the phone and you won't have to, to leave a message. Um, we're open on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but you can uh, send a question to us at Kent County Master Gardeners at gmail.com at any time or pictures. Uh, unfortunately, in the helpline office, we used to have people bring in samples where we could try to identify uh, plants or insects or uh, disease plants, but we are not able to do that physically right now. So the best thing we can do is have you send in a picture, and the way you do that is by emailing it to Kent County Master Gardeners at gmail.com. Um, and this is also our Master Gardener um, website on Delaware State. Um, we also have a page on University of Delaware. Um, Delaware, Delaware State University is where the recordings are. Um, the workshops are available either on either one. Um, so I believe we're winding down the presentation. Um, and Could you I would, tell, tell me what time on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Oh, I'm sorry. Since you're leaving a message, um, it doesn't, you can call anytime and leave a message, but we're answering, we, we get those messages and try to return those calls between 10 and one. Um, so um, if you leave a message and you leave your number, um, we can get back to you. If you send an email, somebody will get back to you. There's no exact time frame. Um, you know, we try to, we just do the best we can. We have a you know, people, different people doing different things. And, um, and so we just, you know, when we get them, we try to take care of them. So <laughs> no, no time frame promises. No, I'm sorry. I thought you said there was going to be live people. Um, oh. That if that happens, it should be from 10 to one. I'm assuming um, it's going to be the same as it always was. Those are always have always been our helpline hours. So we used to have Monday through Friday, but um, we were having a lot of downtime. So now we are only doing it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that'll conclude our session for today. And thank you all my experts and all my participants. Um, it's been fun and we hope to see you in the future. Mm -hmm.